You're listening to the RN Mentor, a podcast designed to document and bring you the work and experience of some of the most influential nurses in our profession. We will be sitting down and having a discussion with the leaders of today's nursing world as they share their work, how they navigate their nursing path, and their views on the future of the profession. My name is Ali Tayeb. I am a registered nurse, United States Navy veteran, a Jonas Veterans Healthcare Scholar, and your host for the RN Mentor. And welcome to the final episode of season four. Excited to be joined today by Dr. Uh, Dania Dunkley. Dr. Dunkley has worked extensively in the arena of maternal child health in hospital and community health care and also in academia. She is currently serving in a full time academic role in the graduate entry pre specialty in nursing and master's of science in nursing program at Yale School of Nursing. Early in her career, Dr. Dunkley became aware of the disparities within the healthcare system and their impact on practitioners and patients, especially those of color. As she transitioned from bedside nursing to administrative roles, she began to understand the factors contributing to these issues, which include a lack of diverse representation in the healthcare workforce, systemic racism, and patient mistrust and avoidance of the healthcare system. Her research on the experiences of Black female executive nurse leaders created the inspiration for founding the League of Extraordinary Black Nurses. Additionally, through her newly formed consulting company, Dania's Joy, she applied strategy to passion, her effort to diversify nursing representation, empower minority nurse leaders, and improve maternal health outcomes. Welcome to the show, Dr. Dunkley. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here with you today. Well, I appreciate your time uh, uh, and and the work that you're doing. And I'm so glad that we had the opportunity to uh, have this discussion with you. Uh, I'll start from the beginning of how did you get started in the world of nursing? I love telling this story. (laughs) (laughs) So I um, uh, migrated here from Jamaica. Um, with my mom back in the early 90s. And all along throughout my childhood, I knew I wanted to be in healthcare. I used to always say, I want to be a a physician. I want to be an OBGYN. I want to help moms and babies. And um, so my mother, who um, came here as she was a school teacher back home, and she always had a a dream of pursuing nursing as a career. So when we came, she made a fresh start and that's, that's, she went for it. So she became a registered nurse. And um, as I'm going through high school and all, she's like, yeah, I know you keep saying you want to go into healthcare, but you know, you know, other than helping me practice on taking blood pressures, you know, you don't know much about it. (laughs) (laughs) Why don't you, you know, try to get some experience and lo and behold, an opportunity came up for me to enroll in a vocational program, an LPN program. And she's like, this would be great. You can continue your high school studies and graduate as an LPN. Why not? It's a win-win. So, and if you hate healthcare, then you have a pretty good idea of why. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, I took her up on that and went for this LPN program, finished it, loved nursing. Still was kind of like, eh, I don't know. Uh, let me go for the pre-med. So I went right off to college on schedule declared pre-med as my major and was like, no, this is not it. I miss what I was doing as an LP. <laughs> I want to go further. And um, so that's how I got my start. I completed my BSN at Hampton University and the rest is kind of history now. <laughs> Six, so what, 17 years later after getting the BSN and now a total of uh, 21 years total as a nurse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, How did you know uh, that you wanted to go into like the maternal child health area and work in that specific uh, specialty? Yeah, as something about that whole the birthing experience, the the process of um, 
pregnancy and childbirth just kind of was always attractive to me. I was one of those kids and young people who would watch like, you know, the TLC birthing stories all the time. Fascinated each time. It, it never got boring to me to watch a new birthing story. And uh, that's pretty much the only area of, of nursing as I went through the different, you know, how we learn, um, but the different um, subspecialties, it's the only one that I ever really had a true connection to. Um, it was this something um, innate about it, something um, just kind of instinctual, instinctive about um, or, or nurturing a new life into the world, right? And so I just, I was in love with it. And uh, just as a coincidence, my mom was a mother baby nurse her whole career. <laughs> ah, so, so, so there was a little bit of influence elsewhere. Just so. a little bit. Just a little she, bit. That kind of, um, kind of made it stick even more. Yeah. yeah. Um, how did you know you were going to go for uh, for like a upper, uh, like getting a master's and your doctoral degrees? What was the decision to, you know what, BSN is not going to be enough for me. Mm -hmm. I need to do more. What was yeah. the in, what was the push for that? I think that um, I, I realized that um, at the bedside, I could be completely happy taking care of, of moms and babies hands on. I loved it. But um, I wanted to broaden my, um, my scope in terms of, of uh, potential opportunities. Right? I didn't want to be limited to just um, bedside care as much as I loved it and as much as I appreciate our frontline staff. I knew that I wanted to go into leadership, um, possibly academia. I always admired all of my professors, you know, um, back in undergrad, and I, I saw myself in them. Right. I said, I could do this. You know, they were very inspiring. So and I knew I needed the educational credentials to be able to do that. Right. Right. Um, so it was a no brainer. Yeah. Um, now, um, that's, uh, you know, it, people have different reasons why they go and they, yeah. they pursue other stuff. One of the reasons, like, for example, I, I decided I was going to go even further because uh, I, I have to admit, like when I first I went into a bachelor's program because I mm -hmm. didn't want to go into a PA initially in my life. I wanted to become a PA. And then I realized it became a, it went from a bachelor's program to a master's program. And I told myself, I'm not doing a master's program. So I, I'm like, <laughs> what else can I do? That's still healthcare that I'm still going to enjoy. And I'm like, hey, nursing still has a bachelor's program. I'll go th to nursing. Yeah. And then, you know, so many years later, I've finished finished up my PhD I'm like nobody would have guessed that that yeah. I was gonna yeah. <laughs> go into get exactly. I didn't even, I didn't even guess that so it's interesting but but my biggest push was I never want to be in a position where my education was going to be that block for or the barrier for me to move forward right like yeah. like hey Ali I know you're qualified but only if you had like your exactly whatever right uh, yeah. I never wanted I never wanted that to be to be the case uh so yeah. uh, that was definitely definitely a part of it too and um just the way my upbringing and background um coming from a family of immigrants and um that push to really um take advantage of all the opportunities that were available to me that i may not have had um you know back home so yeah. it was just kind of incumbent on me to make the most of what was available you know, right, and education right. was one of those things. My mom, she only re, um, went to the associate level mm. as an RN, right? Right, And so for her, the push was, no, you've got to go further than me. And th those were some of the things that um, the way I was socialized as a kid, you know, right. it's kind of like um, this natural path, like, okay, after high school is college. And then, you know, you go into your career and then, yeah, we we're going to push you to do these advanced degrees <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, part of it is just the, the context of being um, a dual minority, you know, being black and female. Right. right. And like right. you said, certain limitations can be placed on you and um, those loopholes like uh, you're qualified, but, you know, you don't want that to be the reason. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. You know. uh, that, yeah. That that would that would have been. Uh, I I faced those barriers before, and mm -hmm. uh, it, it's always been frustrating because um, you never want that to be the case. Um, but uh, I'm interested in. Uh, so your research uh, has to do uh, with uh, 
with um, with minority groups, right? Mm -hmm. um, what pushed you? What did you see? What was your? What were your some observations that that motivated you to said, you know what? I need to fix this, or I need to research this so there's better information out there. What was your sure. motivation behind that? Sure, I think um, the seeds were planted. Um, you know, at during my experience as a staff nurse on the front lines, and then once I. Um, started getting into more leadership positions, I started to realize that um, the further I got away from the bedside, the less uh, nurses in leadership looked like me. Right. And um, it's interesting because I tell people all the time that, um, you know, I sometimes wouldn't notice it. It was very subtle until, because the hospitals I worked for in my, in my experience, um, had some had you know good diversity right representation but when i would go to conferences or mm. <laughs> you know even just visit other hospitals if they were sponsoring events and things like that and meetings i would notice like oh okay i'm, I'm the only one in the room <laughs> and um i i had the 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 fortune to work with a few black cnos and i i was like okay so I got to know, how did you do this? Because when I leave our facility, I'm not seeing the same diversity represented, right? So right. Um, my impetus for going, for researching the topic that I chose, which was the lived experience of being Black and female when becoming a nurse executive, is because I saw myself on that pathway, right? At the time, I was on that leadership trajectory uh, I was at the director level in my career, and in the next few years, I saw, you know, as I was going through my PhD program, I thought, <laughs> this is where I was headed, right? right. Something strange happens when you pursue a, doc a doctorate, right? <laughs> you like, start Like they turn your mind around, right? It's they like the light, the switch just went off on so many things. And I realized that, uh, one, I, I absolutely loved the whole process of research and um, writing and um, and that was intriguing to me. Um, but the other part was I, I really wanted to explore more advocacy and um, raising awareness and pushing for other minority nurses who might have been either afraid to pursue careers in leadership. So I, I think that my passion would have been better utilized in, in that capacity rather than actually pursuing the pathway of a CNO, right? So that's exactly what happened. And I said, you know, um, initially I, I had wanted to uh, go into academia anyway. I said, well, once I finish this doctorate, I'm just going to take a leap of faith and um, leave that, that trajectory that I was on and really pursue my, my passions and where I felt that I could make the most impact. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, yeah, because like I, you mentioned, you know, being in a PhD program, it really does like like mess with your brain when you're in a PhD program, right? Mm -hmm. It really like if you you you're forced. I don't know what they do. That you're sort of forced to think beyond what you what we're taught and ingrained and and uh, like anything environmental that that has kind of set your. Uh, your sort of your mind map of yeah. how things are supposed to be. Uh, and that's one of the things I appreciate from my, from my PhD program is it really forces you to kind of tear all that down and rethink yes. everything that you thought was the norm yeah. uh, and how to, how to reevaluate everything. I think that's one of the things I appreciate. Um, so yeah, it really does mess with your brain. It does. It really does. <laughs> in, 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 the, in the best of ways. Though. In the best of ways. <laughs> and, uh, like, like, you know, like you come out a different person and sometimes people Dude. like it and sometimes some people don't like it. So it's, you know, but it is no, it is. no folks were like, are you crazy? Because I mean, to be completely transparent, right, with with, you, you know, you know how it is in our field. I, you know, was in a lucrative career. I was, you know, you know, doing great. Yeah. You know, I had no reason to leave it. Um, and so folks were like, are you sure? Because, you know, academia, you know, fill in the blank. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, no, I, I have to do this. I, I want to give back. I see myself in this, in, in this role, being able to impact more lives 
Um, and not to say that I couldn't have done that in leadership, but this gives me the freedom. Um, and we talked a little bit about freedom before we started um, to really do with your life what, what you feel passionate about, right? right? And making the connections um, that you feel are important and, and, and what your true core values are. Um, and I thought, this is, this is it, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I when yeah, I mean, I mean, it was, it was very similar to me. Uh, I got to a point in my career. Well, well, really in my PhD program where, mm -hmm. uh, the organization I was working with, uh, was, uh, kind of put, gave, gave me a, gave me a sort of a choice. They gave me choices. They said, you can work here full time or finish up your PhD. I said, well, thank you very much. I think I'm going to finish up my PhD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I guess my academic career is going to come sooner than later. And yeah. I went, I went into a, into a part-time position and eventually went into a tenure track position. So it just worked out that way. Um, uh, and th the pay difference wasn't exciting, but no, I no, but, <laughs> but, but academia really gets gives you the opportunity to work on what really brings you joy yeah. and and gives you opportunities to be creative that you normally may not have in the confines of a hospital or a or a clinic or those yeah. four walls that um, so yeah, that's one thing I appreciate about being in academia is not only you get to, mold new brains uh yeah. but but you also have that opportunity to uh to pursue other things that you you're yeah. passionate and about. and that's encouraged actually yes right? because yes it makes you a better um uh, uh professor or teacher right right uh, you know right exactly um now speaking of things that bring you passion you uh you created a, a non-profit mm -hmm. uh at the league of extraordinary extraordinary black nurses mm -hmm. uh tell us a little bit about that what it's about and how did you because sure. making making non-profits isn't easy and i know a handful of people that have done it but i how, like, tell us about it <laughs> sure um another um thing that was inspired by uh my doctoral research right um in the stories of my participants the common one of the common themes was the absence or lack of um, mentorship opportunities mm -hmm. and guidance, um, you know, throughout the, the, the career pipeline, you know, from the bedside all the way through the C-suite and um, even, even before the bedside, right? So in schools, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, well, there are some organizations um, that have mentorship programs and um, you know, these things exist if you know where to look for the resource. But in terms of really catering to specific groups, minority groups in particular, um, you know, there weren't many. Um, and there still aren't um, in terms of national organizations. Um, the National uh, Black Nurses Association is, the, you know, the, one of the oldest and still right. standing and still very strong. And I certainly admired um, what they're doing and I participate in things that they do, but I felt that why do we just need to have one right. <laughs> that represents us, right? You know, um, the communities of color, you know, sometimes we tend to lump everyone together in the same buckets, you know, and we're not a monolith, right? We have different um, uh, subsets and, and, and subgroups and, you know, why, why not make more organizations that represent us and right, support exactly. us? So um, I decided I wanted to create uh, this nonprofit and it's founded on three um, guiding principles, mentorship, which was, you know, of course, one of the things that came out of my research scholarship. So focusing on, you know, how we can develop um, new research um, and add to the profession and um, leadership, right? Uh, because I feel that that is somewhere that we're severely underrepresented. Um, and if we wanna influence the profession and healthcare in general um, needs to be uh, improved. So that's where that was birthed. Is there a, is there a specific uh, level that you provide that service to, or, you know, that uh, well, it's not really, it's not really a service, but that, um, 
environment for, uh, yeah. or are you, or do you, is the organization uh, kind of focused on everybody or anybody right. who, who, who wants to um, come like, let, let's say, I'm a, let's say I'm an ADN uh, mm -hmm. level nurse. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there opportunities for me? Also, if I'm a PhD prepared nurse, is there an opportunity for me? Absolutely. Um, for, for this, for the purpose of, of LEBN uh, for short, um, we really try to focus on nurses that are in practice. Um, that's the target group, the target population. Um, for those who wanna go into uh, pursue careers in leadership, for, um, for those who are still at the bedside who just need a little bit of um, more mentorship and guidance. Um, and for experienced nurses, what, uh, and, and like you said, at the doctoral level or you know, advanced degree level, we invite them to be mentors mm. for, for the other nurses. So there are certainly opportunities there um, for everyone. And we try to um, have uh, monthly workshops that kind of attune to that, that kind of span of folks. Um, we've done workshops that are geared towards new grads, right? So what to expect when you enter the profession. Um, we've done some development uh, things for nurses currently in. The last one we did was on resilience, right? You know, with this pandemic and, and, and burnout being a huge concern. So there's a little something for, for, for most people, if not everyone. That, that's, that's very, that's, um, uh, it's, um, it's, as you're talking about this, I mean, it, like the, the, the thought is popping into my head that we've had traditionally organizations in nursing that have been, that have excluded um, mm -hmm. uh, minority nurses, mm -hmm. right, historically. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, and as a result, um, organizations developed or developed to be inclusive because they were excluded from the bigger exactly. organizations. It's interesting for me because, for example, you, uh, how long ago uh, was, 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 was your nonprofit created? Uh, 2018. Officially. Yeah, so fairly new, right? Yep. So your organization yep. was developed. Uh, I know a doctor, uh, I don't know if you know Dr. McCammy from DMPs mm -hmm. of Color. Yes. Her organization is fairly new. It's, it feels a little, uh, I wonder if, um, if the larger organizations, are doing enough because there's still a void and a need for organizations like yours to develop because there's still it feels yeah. like it feels like there's still a lot of exclusion happening right yeah. um I, I was just looking at some photos of a recent uh one of the we'll just call it a large nursing organization that is having their um conference as we speak mm -hmm. and i'm looking at all the pictures of former leaders and who's getting awards and accolades and it's still very white right yes. um so i'm and i'm and i'm and i'm thinking even though there's diversity work happening within the world of nursing what are we really doing that is uh, changing um changing the 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 like the foundational policies and things like that that have historically been very, very exclusionary yeah. Um, because we're still seeing um, individuals like mm -hmm. yourself that are seeing gaps and are filling gaps. Mm -hmm. But I wonder uh, what are we, what are they not doing? And I guess it's for them to really kind of yeah. um, do a yeah. self-assessment. Like if I was yeah. an organization that I'm saying diversity, 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 but I'm still seeing other organizations filling that gap that I'm not filling. Mm -hmm. I should be doing some kind of a self-assessment, right? Yeah. Um, it's one thing to, to say that you um, are advocating for diversity, right? It's another thing to, to take that walk and, and take deliberate steps towards recruiting right. those diverse nurses in the, into your organization. And it may not be, the, 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 the issue may not be that they're being excluded, but they're also not being intentionally invited either. Right. right. So, right. And, and, and invited, uh, invited or recruited and retained. Exactly. Right. Like you're, exactly. you're creating, you're creating that environment that they can thrive in that environment. Right. right. Cause if I was, uh, if I was one of 30, right. Uh, and I'm the only one of my uh, ethnicity, color, uh, you know, background, mm -hmm. that is not a very 
that would not seem to me to me to be a very inviting environment, no. right? Because no. I'm one of one in a, exactly. in a room of in a room of thirty. So we need to really change uh, change the, those dynamics of um, of what our environments look like. Because having one representation or just two representation to say you're diverse may may not be the answer. That's or right. when your board of directors is all well, uh, you know, yeah. It, exactly. It, There's that right? too. Right. There's that too, because I know a number <laughs> of organizations where the leadership is definitely diverse, mm -hmm. but it's the it's like the one leader that is diverse, right. but the board of directors that is <laughs> pulling the strings of every, the entire organization is very white. Um, yeah. So I think there's a lot of work that we need to do there. Or like yeah. there's even organization. Now I'm going on this tangent of organizations mm -hmm. that are nursing but they're being led by board of directors that are non-nursing non-nursing oh yeah right? so Absolutely. that becomes so we need to really like kind of really look at who, who where we are what we're doing mm -hmm. as as a profession uh, so we're so we're doing a better job um so i, I love that i i love the um the league of extraordinary black nurses if somebody wanted to join this organization how would they go about doing it do they just look you sure. up or yeah, no, they do. Um, we have a website. We have a presence on social media as well. And right now, initially when we started just going through growing pains and not really even, you know, I'm a nurse. I don't, I'm not a business person, right? So <laughs> <laughs> initially, you know, we had the option for membership, but we really wanted to um, build up our programs, build our infrastructure. So the option to um, join as a paid member is not currently available, um, but we're doing some work behind the scenes to revamp that so that there is value for what you're right. paying for, for membership, There's, right? And sustainability. And exactly. And right, so right. that's that will be coming soon. But for now, for those who want to support and be a part and take part in some of the programs that we do currently offer, um, they can just go ahead and join the mailing list and um, follow us on social media. Everything that we do is posted and updated regularly um, so they can find out about any workshops or upcoming events. That's fantastic. And by the way, for, a, for all of our listeners, we'll have links to, uh, to Dr. Dunkley's uh, organizations, uh, social media sites, all that will be available to you. So just make sure you go on to uh, the webs into our website and all the links will be there. If you can't find, you should be able to find her. I'm sure it's uh, it's, it won't be difficult. Um, now, you also have a consulting company because you have extra time on your hands, apparently. Uh, now, tell us about this. Uh, exactly. <laughs> not, not an overachiever at all. At all. Uh, <laughs> not at all. Not nope. at all. Uh, now, tell us about your... So, you have uh, uh, Dania's um, Joy... At, Part of a, as part of a consulting company. And this is one of the things actually uh, caught my eye when I initially saw you on social media. Uh, and you also have a program that's called the, the Sequel Effect. And I want to talk to you about that. I'm a fan of Mary Sequel. Sure. So I just want to see what that's all about. Uh, so tell I us about it. your uh, your um, non your your consulting company. Sure. So Dania's Joy, um, inspired by um, uh, my mother, who her first name was Joy, right? So that's where that came from. If, if folks are wondering, why did you name the company that? <laughs> <laughs> but it also um, is kind of a representation of what brings me joy, right? Mm. Um, and as we talked about pursuing my passions earlier, um, there are a few things that bring me joy, but the three things that the, that the company focuses on is um, diversifying um, nursing representation, in the profession, um, helping to empower and support minority nurse leaders, and then the focus also on improving Black maternal health outcomes. So um, my background in maternal health obviously inspires that. Um, uh, and given the fact that I um, you know, would love to have children in the future too, and the current landscape is not looking very promising, for folks who look like me, um, the outcomes are, are disp completely disparate at this time um, in terms of mortality and morbidity. And um, I, I also stemming from um, 
my journey as a nurse leader, right? And again, not having that, that support and development, intentional support and development from my organization and also um, the underrepresentation of nurses throughout um, the different levels, but specifically in nursing leadership. So the CECOL effect is um, a course that was inspired, like you said, by nurse uh, Mary Seacole, who actually uh, did not come to know about until pretty far along in my nursing career. <laughs> and it's yeah, strange. <laughs> Yeah, me too. I was like, I was like, who is this Mary Seacole? Because I yeah. have never heard it. it's who been up, it? up until that point. It was like Nightingale, Nightingale, Nightingale. Yep. And I was like, I can't relate to this Florence Nightingale you speak of. Uh, <laughs> and I saw Mary Seacole. And I'm like, well, uh, you know, she, she immigrated. She, yeah. she was sort of a startup, uh, like mm-hmm. didn't quite fit in. And she tried to fit in. And yeah, exactly. all, I'm, like, I'm like, I can, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a black woman, but I am, but I was relating to her, to her work a lot more than I was with the Florence Nightingale, mm-hmm. uh, sort of the, uh, the um, uh, story I was being told yes. over, over years. So I, I love the fact that you, you called it that, but I interrupted. Yeah. Go ahead, no, no, please. no. All good. All good. I love it. Um, so she, um, I've come, become sort of obsessed with her story um, because not many know that she was around at the same time as Florence Nightingale, but obviously overshadowed and um, unrecognized for her contributions in that same war, by the way, right? Right. Right. (laughs) And and she was more in the thick of the war than than Florence Nightingale was. Florence Nightingale was like a couple of hundred miles away from the action. Mary Mm -hmm. Seacol was smack dab in the middle of it. Right there. And, um, you know, interesting enough is, is that we hear a lot about Mary Mahoney and her contributions and obviously, right. you know, huge, huge um, trailblazer in our, in our field in terms of um, minorities, but Mary Seacol doesn't really get much recognition. So I didn't learn about her, like I said, until way, way um, in the middle of my, my nursing career. But once I learned, I was like, oh my goodness. So, um, you know, be, you know, inspired by my research findings of uh, these executive um, nurses, um, I thought, how can I honor her story and their stories um, and create something that would help develop other nurse leaders, right? Since that's what I'm about. And I thought the sequel effect, right? So what, what is that, right? How um, how does her story affect us in this current time? And it's like you said, right? Um, she was one that took a chance and um, went out on her own, you know, paid for her own travel, you know, right. to be able to go out and help um, because that's who she was. You know, she had the knowledge, she had the skills and she wanted to help. But, um, you know, there were so many obstacles in her way. Um, but she said, you know what? you know, if this is who I am and this is my passion, I'm going to go for it. And I think that speaks to um, so many um, issues that we currently see facing um, those who aspire to become nurse leaders, right? There are, there are obstacles and um, you're not quite sure who to ask um, the, the, the questions or where to go for support. Um, you don't even know what you don't know. Sometimes right. you get thrown into these roles and you're like, ah, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, you know, and I don't want to look like a failure. So then, you know, you, you're isolated um, unnecessarily because you keep silent, you know, wanting to fit the part. Right. Um, and, and I think about these things as I was a nurse leader. And so that's where the sequel effect came from, informed by my research findings, my own personal experiences and, um, you know, the, the current literature on leadership. Um, It's only a three hour course. I can't fit everything in there, (laughs) but it is a start for any uh, nurse who is thinking about transitioning into nursing leadership, any nurse who is um, specifically a nurse of color who is thinking, who has just um, entered into a position of nursing leadership. Um, This course will kind of help give you some insight and tips from others who have achieved a level of success in nursing leadership um, on how they overcame their obstacles, some of the best practices. Um, And really the key piece is navigating the career ladder 
in spaces where you are perhaps underrepresented because mm. that adds a whole nother dynamic to it right. right I talked about the isolation and sometimes feeling like you know you're being set up to fail yeah um so it's it's that's um those are some of the key pieces of the sequel effect masterclass. yeah that, that that's great I mean you're you're definitely filling uh filling a need that I think exists out there um as you're as you're talking about this again um I have um being being uh, uh someone who identifies as a male in the profession of nursing uh, even though a lot of people say uh, men have it easy because, you know, you see the how bigger salaries and all, all that stuff, which, uh, you know, I'm sorry to say I have never experienced uh, uh, bigger <laughs> salaries than my counterparts, but that's mm-hmm. that's a whole different story. I may be one of the few that didn't didn't get the memo on that, uh, <laughs> but the research is out there. So I'll, I'm just going to go with it. Uh, but there's definitely, there's, there's op- sometimes there are opportunities for us that we look at and it's just a matter of we say yes to it or no to it. And if we're, if we have prepped ourselves to be comfortable with saying yes to those opportunities, mm-hmm. because I think that, that what you're providing uh, is key from the perspective of people can say that or, or can feel comfortable that they are prepared to take on a role because they have mentors, right? Exactly. Or they have the background or they know how to take the next step, yes. right? And bypass some of those obstacles. And I think that's what's key about a program like yours is uh, people have this resource that they can tap into yeah. uh, that normally they would not have the exemplars um, yeah. Um, that 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 other people can provide for them. So I think that that that's key to this program. Yeah, there are some of the things that we talk about um, are one of the things that when you enter a position of of leadership is that yes, you have the job description, right? Right, those things that you need to check these boxes for your employer to be pleased, right? That meets right. organizational goals, and we do talk about that. But then there is an uh, unspoken pressure to when you're in these positions because there's so few of us in them, right? You kind of tend to take on the weight of the world, right? I can't fail, number one, because Mm. I'm, you know, oh my God, how did I even get in this role, right? And then there's this whole concept of imposter syndrome. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not qualified enough. and then you also feel obligated to then open doors for others to, to be able to, 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 um, to come along with you. Right. Right. So these are some of the, the pressures that are unspoken when you're in leadership as a minority as well. And we go through those things because nobody talks about this stuff. You know, it's right. just like all about the job, but there are some, some other uh, responsibilities that come with it too. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, as you're talking about this, um, like I'm thinking of like I, I teach nursing leadership and even though I bring uh, some of the well, I, I haven't always done this. I, I started purposefully including some of this stuff about um, two years ago. Uh, I purposefully started including race and racism and um, bias within within the healthcare system and within nursing into the classroom. And it does make some some of my students uncomfortable, Yeah, uh, which is OK, which mm-hmm. I tell them it's OK to be uncomfortable. Actually, I do want you to be uncomfortable because you it'll make probably a bigger impression on you. Uh, you shouldn't be comfortable with these conversations that we're having. Right. They're, they're very much in our profession and we, have, uh, we haven't done a whole lot to fix the, like the, the roots of the cause within the mm-hmm. profession of nursing. So I think I, I'm okay with them like knowing and being uncomfortable with the topics that we discuss. Uh, so I appreciate, uh, like I said, I, it's, it's very true that um, you are you are being set you sometimes feel like you're being set up to fail uh, mm-hmm. and that's a that's a that's a real um that's a real um issue with uh with being a minority within mm-hmm. the profession of nursing which is primarily um white yes. and female and female mm-hmm. um so i, I can definitely uh, I can relate to some degree to some of the things that you're, that you're as I'm sure a lot of our listeners yeah. um, do as well. Um, so yeah, that is, that's great. Now, if you had, um, 
if you had any advice for any up and coming uh, nurse leader, uh, uh, yeah. um, uh, what would that be? Whether uh, of any 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 background, in order to ensure that sure. we do a better job in uh, in supporting diversity in the world of nursing, what would that be? Um, I would say get yourself a mentor. But it just immediately, like <laughs> there is no shame in asking for help. Like I said, sometimes you don't even know what you don't know. Right. Attach yourself to the folks that are successful at doing what it is that you aspire to do. Um, and, and not only that, but also look for opportunities for sponsorship, right? So a lot of... Um, a lot of the times it's not, you always hear this cliche, right? It's not what you know, but who. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes- your, net, gate, your network, right? Your yeah, network. your network and your net worth, right? Exactly. So you're, you're, sometimes all it takes is for one person to speak about you in at the right time and the doors float open. Right. Um, and many nurses don't know how to network, right? Um, so invest in um, building um, relationships, authentic ones too, not just because you're looking for a, a position, but really making authentic connections with folks who can mentor you, who can nurture you. And those connections will, will eventually come in terms of opportunities for employment and advancement, right? Because you've built these relationships. I can't tell you how many things have gone my way just from getting to know people right. and building authentic connections. And they'll recommend you without even having to ask, <laughs> you know? Right. Um, I think that's a huge skill that isn't necessarily taught in schools. Um, and uh, it was a, a, definitely a huge lesson for me as I went along in my career. Right. Uh, I get a lot of, I, br I just bring up the topic of networking with my students quite a bit uh, because, uh, you know, I, and I always tell them I'm a huge introvert, which I am. Same. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> right. But I say it's a learned skill. Networking is a learned skill. You force That's yourself cool. into that situation and you start talking to people. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, and I always tell them, but you need to be, you need to go and network with people purposefully. Right? right. Not just to add another name into your Rolodex, but you go with a purpose and network right. with people that which means for me, for me, it means you need to have something that you're also con contributing That's to right. that relationship. It shouldn't be this that I'm just going to take, take, take. You need to give, give, give a little mm -hmm. bit in that. It needs to be a mutually beneficial, even though we have we do have some incredible mentors out there that will allow you to just take, 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 right? But yeah. uh, preferably you have something to contribute as well. Uh, and where does that contribution uh, come from? Uh, and I think that that's important. Uh, but I am, I always tell people, it's a matter of you uh, getting out there and start communicating people. Uh, social media has been incredible for me. Oh, yeah. uh, Oh, especially I, I think over the last, what is it like 20 months or so now mm -hmm. that we've sort of been stuck in, stuck at home. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's been a great opportunity. I've really learned, I think, how to network through social media over the last 20 months, which mm -hmm. is something that, which I hadn't done before. All my networking had been in person conferences, things like that, which are, which are great. Mm -hmm. but how, it's a different skill set to network through social media. Yeah. Um, so maybe yeah. that could that could be one of your master classes, oh, networking yeah. through social media. I think that's a great <laughs> idea. It's like you said, I'm I'm naturally um, an introvert, and if you had asked me, you know, would I be sitting here doing this podcast with you or any of the other uh, things that I've done in the past, you know, even two years or so? Um, no, I wouldn't have <laughs> wouldn't have imagined myself doing this. But one of the other things that I would say to um, young uh, emerging um, leaders emerging in their careers is, is your mindset has to do, it, 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 it's critical, right? How you think about yourself, how you, um, how you um, present yourself in the world, but also how you think about your position in the world matters right so if you're naturally an introvert and you're saying okay everything's gonna just you know happen it doesn't 
That's, <laughs> right? It just right. does it. <laughs> no. You have to sometimes come, come out of yourself and uh, think about where you're trying to get to and what steps it's going to take to get there. And uh, sometimes you have to kind of step out of your comfort zone in order to achieve these things right. and not saying you're going to go ex- against everything that who you are as a core individual but your mindset has to be in the place that you're trying to get to if that makes sense yeah um, like people have to know where you, people have to know what your goals are in life yes yeah and and so they know they can help you get there because there are a lot of people out there who are willing mm-hmm. to help Mm-hmm. up and coming nurses get to their next step mm-hmm. but if i don't know what your next step is or if you even have an interest in a next step mm-hmm. i'm not necessarily going to know i need to help you with that or i can help you with that right yeah um, so i think that i think that's that's the key thing with networking you have to be okay i always tell my uh, uh you know i force some of my students not i don't force them but i told uh, well, it's sort of i guess it's for when you're asking as part of an assignment i guess you force your students uh-huh. to do it. but i told them to like you know create an elevator elevator speech mm-hmm. right like if you don't have an elevator speech at least at the minimum about what you do and who you are mm-hmm. uh you're not you're you're already behind because that elevator speech about where what you who you are and where you want to go you mm-hmm. never know when you need to pop that out and share it with somebody. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's been multiple times where I've been, I've actually literally, I was in an elevator with uh, with somebody who I know very well now. And we had briefly spoken on the phone. And then I looked over and I saw her badge. I'm like, oh, you're so-and-so. And she, mm-hmm. and she said, yes. I'm like, we talked on the phone. Here's what I was talking about. And I went through, <laughs> literally yeah. in an elevator, gave her my elevator speech. Yeah. And her and I have worked several times together since, but uh, you never know when you have to pull that, pull out that elevator speech Absolutely. And, and share and with preparation. Someone. Preparation is key. You know, right. you, it, like you said, you have to know where, where you'd like to go and you have to kind of walk through, okay, what steps do I need to get there? And if you, if you're struggling with that, there is help available. I think sometimes we don't want to be looked at as, um, uh, incompetent or un- incapable, but I think there's more strength in asking for help than, right. than anything else, right? Yeah. Um, rather than trying to fake it, and <laughs> fake it till you make it. <laughs> <laughs> that sometimes works. It doesn't always sometimes. work. <laughs> uh, not, not a foolproof plan. <laughs> not, not a foolproof <laughs> plan at all. Uh, so I want to be uh, cognizant of your time. Anything else you want to share with, our, with the audience uh, while we have you? Um, you know, th- this was a great conversation. We've covered so many things. Um, I would just uh, appeal to uh, my last point about asking for help. Sometimes, um, and this is one of the services I, I, I offer through my consulting company, right? Having um, a mentor, but sometimes it goes beyond that and you might need a coach. So I, you know, um, shameless plug uh, is one of the services in addition to the C goal effect that I do offer um, career coaching because sometimes um, you need a little bit of help making that plan or seeing what it is that uh, your goal is. Um, Where do you want to head in your career trajectory? So um, seeking opportunities for help, sometimes they're free, sometimes you got to pay for them. But if you're making the investment into your your own growth and development, then it'll be worth it. But that, that's that's that's, that's about that, it. Uh, that's great, and and I and I don't mind you shamelessly plugging anything. <laughs> I, I, I I always I always you know uh, my wife and I get in this conversation sometimes. She's all like, "Why are you not charging for some of the work that you do?" And I'm like, "Well, it's part of you know." building and some of the work I do and um, but you know I always but there's always a worth there's some kind of a worth for me in the work work that I do so if I don't think I'm necessarily benefiting from it Mm -hmm. I may charge for it Uh, you know like you're gonna have to pay for my time Uh, but there are other times where you know things are uh, things are uh, so technically when I do you know uh, my students are technically 
you know, they do pay for my services because they're mm-hmm. paying tuition, right? <laughs> That's a good <laughs> so way to look at it, right? <laughs> their, their tuition, technically, when I coach them through their, you know, uh, anything, uh, that has paid time for me, technically, Absolutely. right? Uh, so technically, they are, they are that that is paid time for me. So I have to, we need to like rethink, I'm like, it's not free. You're paying me to tell, give you advice on, on your yeah. career and your next yep. steps. <laughs> So, uh, so thank you. So th- thank you so much on this. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I wish you the best of luck. Um, I think you're filling a need that is, uh, that is very much there. Um, and, thank and you. I hope mo- mo- more people take advantage of your, uh, of your services. Uh, like I said, I think, uh, as a profession, we need to do a better job in how we are getting, Mm-hmm. Uh, how, developing the diversity that we are hearing so much people so many people talk about mm-hmm. uh, I, I just wish there was more uh, more things I was seeing that we were seeing from it um, so I, I'm impatient when it comes to this stuff so I'll, <laughs> some people say we're, it takes we're, time we're making steps we're making we're, steps we're, we're making progress it's yeah. one faster yeah. progress all right <laughs> well thank you so much and i greatly appreciate you being here uh with us and sharing your story i, I love the story and thank you for sharing it with us thank you uh, so much uh, we i want to again uh thank dr dunkley for joining us today and want to thank you all for your continued support of the rm mentor podcast season five will be back january 25th 2022 until that time please be safe and we will see you soon You have been listening to the RN Mentor with your host, Ali Taya. Please don't forget to visit www.aliartayeb.com. That's www.aliartayeb.com for podcast notes and resources. And don't forget to subscribe. Until next time, I wish you fair winds and following seas.